Ladies and gents, my name is Brandon Stover. Welcome to the How to Solve Climate Change course from Plato University. Causes, systems, obstacles, solutions to this global challenge is what you're going to learn here today. When you're ready to learn more skills, join us for free at Plato.University. Let's get started with today's lesson. We'll have our expert guests briefly introduce themselves and their credentials for why they are able to speak to this topic. My name is Ravi Gajendran. I'm a professor at Florida International University College of Business in the Global Leadership and Management Department. I am also the department chair. I also hold the Alva Chapman Eminent Scholar Chair in, in, the, in the College of Business. I have a PhD in organizational behavior, and I've been studying uh, remote work as a uh, topic of research inquiry since you know uh, 2004. One of my one of my my first academic paper was in 2007, which was a meta analysis on this topic, which is essentially a quantitative synthesis of all the work that's been done uh, by scholars on remote work, and you know sort of accumulating that into one paper to kind of give overall you know directions around why we should care about remote work and what it does for employee performance and attitudes. So, and then I've I've published in this domain since, and so I've continued working on topics such as remote work and communication technology, distributed teams for several uh, years now. Uh, can you explain succinctly to us what remote work is from first principles? Sure. I mean, it's getting harder to do that, uh, but, you know, at least initially remote work was work done instead of being in an office, right? So, so a traditional office is you show up, you know, nine to five at some location to do your work, right? And remote work really is taking some element of that and saying, okay, I can do the same task at a different location rather than sort of the central office location. And that's what telecommuting was about. It was, you know, commuting via telephone or information communication technology instead of showing up at office. So there's you know, substitution of place involved in remote work, right? But increasingly, you know, after the pandemic, so the whole idea of remote work itself, you know, the default, you know, the pandemic was, you know, a lot, at least for knowledge work kind of jobs, the default was you would work, you know, four or five days a week from home, occasionally coming into the office. So, you know, especially since the pandemic, the notion of the traditional nine to five office has changed. Right, and so our understanding of remote work has also changed in many ways. Uh, during the pandemic, the default was full-time, you know, almost full-time remote work, and office work was, you know, the less traditional alternative in that context. And as we come out from the pandemic, our understanding of remote work has shifted to what people are now calling hybrid work, right? Which is you spend some time in the office and you send, spend some time at home. Uh, and it may not be substitution. Things you do in the office may not necessarily substitute for what you do at home or vice versa. Maybe you do different things in the office and you do different things at home. And so remote work is essentially a spectrum of working which involves, you know, at least, you know, some time away from a central work location, you know, your, your traditional office, to working full time away from the office, maybe, you know, even in a different city, or maybe, you know, you might even be in Costa Rica while you work for you know, somebody in the U.S., right? So, so remote work is working, you know, working outside the bounds of a traditional nine to five uh, office. And it ranges from, you know, maybe half a day away from the office to a day away from the office, which is what, you know, what we call low intensity remote work to more high intensity remote work, which is, you know, your full time away in a, in a different location. Why might remote work help to solve climate change? So it's one part of the equation. So, so solving climate change is obviously, to my knowledge, a very complex phenomenon involving, uh, you know, different parts of society having to change their behaviors, right? And so remote work can be a contributor to alleviate some of the issues that, that contribute to climate change, right? So the, the basic thing is you're not commuting, right? And a lot of commuting in the U.S. involves people, like lone individuals sitting in a car driving to office, right? And I, I, when I, I, I grew up in India and when I moved to the U.S., I found it very amusing that, you know, you know those pools, the carpooling lanes, 
said that high occupancy vehicles had need to have two people or more, right? And to me, I found that amusing. The two people can make a high occupancy vehicle, whereas you know where where I grew up, you know, you you were packed like sardines into a bus or a train or you know something, and that would be really what I would term a high occupancy vehicle. So, so to the extent that remote work can help cut down on some of those you know carbon heavy commuting, uh, I think it might. You know, it, it, that's one of the primary or more direct ways in which, you know, remote work contributes to reducing you know, the carbon footprint, so to speak. The second way in which remote work might contribute is the, especially post-pandemic, it's become very normal uh, for remote. So remote work has become more widespread, right, post-pandemic. So more people are doing it. So more people are, are commuting less as a consequence. So the scale has gone up. But equally, alongside remote work becoming sort of mainstream, what has happened is it's also become more acceptable to not meet in person, right? It's more acceptable to, you know, have a Zoom meeting instead of, you know, showing up someplace and meeting in person, right? And it cuts down on business travel to some extent. And so the, the, the fact that remote work has become mainstream also means there are associated ways of interacting with others that could potentially reduce the amount of travel that individuals have, business travel that individuals have to undertake, which could contribute to, you know, reduction overall in the carbon footprint. So, so it's, it's hard to quantify exactly what the, what the impact is going to be, I think, but it's going to be a net positive overall, right? And, and I think as we go forward, you know, we would have seen a natural, if, if things have continued as they are, we would have seen a natural uh, growth in the number of people commuting worldwide to work. And I think even though the number of, even though I think business travel and people commuting is still growing, I think it won't grow as much as it would have had remote work not been in the picture. So if, if anything, remote work may slow down the growth. And if, you know, if we want to be optimistic, it might actually you know, lower the overall carbon footprint from prior years. So, so we don't know yet. We haven't done the calculations. So I'm just, you know, I'm speculating based on, my, I'm extrapolating based on my knowledge base here. And that's how I see, you know, it being part of the, the climate change uh, solution. Looking at the other side of it, where may remote work fall short of helping to solve climate change or make things exacerbate the problem? Yeah, so the other aspect of this is remote work increases reliance on information and communication technologies, right? It it makes the it makes us more and more reliant on the cloud, right? So one of the one of the things that is accelerating the shift in remote work is the cloud infrastructure, right? And cloud the cloud infrastructure requires a very carbon heavy presence of you know servers and you know computing architecture that is energy intensive. So while remote work may reduce carbon footprint through reduced commuting, it might it might have an impact somewhere else in terms of you know these IT related costs. Right, uh, everybody needs laptops. Everybody needs you know computing devices at home. You might have you know multiple you might, instead of having one laptop, you might have two. Instead of having one chair, you might duplicate you know you might have two chairs, etc. So you might end up increasing the amount of stuff that you consume to support remote work. And there is no easy way of accounting for it in a neat sense, right? It's easier to kind of quantify what's the, you know, if you're going into office half the time compared to, you know, three years ago, you can quantify that in terms of saying, okay, X miles on average, you know, X gallons, et cetera. And you can create a, a that's easier to quantify. But this other stuff is more hidden and we don't pay attention to, but, you know, might, on the uh, on the other side of the ledger, actually increase uh, carbon footprint. And I still believe when we start thinking about it overall, I think it's a net positive for climate change. But we have to be mindful that uh, there may be other ways in which you know remote work might drive up the carbon footprint that overall contributes the energy costs that overall contribute to climate change. Looking at the stakeholders involved with remote work, who benefits the most and who may be harmed the most from remote work as a solution? So I think, you know, let's start with the employee, right? It's, it's employees gain because they gain flexibility, they gain more control over their time. 
they gain more economy over there and how they do their work. Uh, so overall, you know, employees do tend to gain. At the same time, uh, there are costs which are more hidden, right? So, you know, employees are meeting people less often. Uh, employees are not going into office less often. So maybe, you know, stakeholders like, you know, people who provide lunch, uh, restaurants, and, uh, you know, those kind of businesses could be harmed. So one of the downsides is, you know, for the employees, they have less contact with supervisors and others. And that could be, we don't know exactly how that, you know, relative to the autonomy benefits, the flexibility benefits, how this uh, affects individuals. We'll know over time as more and more people engage in remote work, whether, you know, there is a general decaying of social skills, there's general decaying, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence that says that, you know, having human contact is important for people's well-being. So if remote work, you know, reduces that, you know, there's going to be some effect. We, we really don't know yet how that's going to play out. So from the employee's perspective, you know, there are clear positives, but there are also things to keep in mind. Let's go to the organization, right? The organization benefits because of if employees are not coming in as much, they don't need to maintain these big offices in a central downtown. Uh, so they might be able to reduce their footprint. But then people who built those offices, those commercial real estate companies, et cetera, might suffer, at least in the short term, to figure out, you know, how do we then repurpose that to, to stay viable? Right? So, so there's that flip side. And companies can, you know, if you take remote work on extreme, what prevents companies from firing people, say, in the U.S. and hiring people in a much lower cost geography? This has already happened, right? Jobs are also to Philippines, to India, to Brazil, and so on. This could end up accelerating that trend where companies are looking for the lowest cost talent, and because everything can be done remotely, uh, suddenly you have you know even even you know white collar jobs being outsourced to the cheapest location, right? And so so there are some potential societal costs that you know will unfold over time, uh, and you add that to AI, you know you, ha- you you don't know where it's all going to end up. It's really hard to predict. So those are some of the costs. I mean, uh, the other sort of, uh, so in terms of society, I think society benefits from remote work overall, uh, but also in terms of things like business continuity, right? If you have a terrorist attack or something like that, because people are distributed in different places, it's easier to uh, keep operations going if you have the infrastructure to work remotely. So let's say, God forbid, you know, another pandemic strikes us or some you know, terrible event overtakes us, there is still business continuity in place if you can if you have the infrastructure to work remotely. Looking at sort of the nuts and bolts of it, how is remote work effectively implemented as a solution? So maybe the parts to it or the steps to be able to implement it effectively. It's it's a very complex question, uh, and the answer is simply that it depends on the type of job, the type of organization, and what's exactly what is their what are their norms, what's the how are supervisors trained. So the starting point, I think, you know, from a larger sort of 10,000 foot level is remote work is like any other work arrangement, right? So managers and CEOs and organizations are paid to make work more efficient, right? They're paid to make things work better. And so the onus for improving remote work practices does not lie with the employee. It's not, you should not be asking the employee to justify their remote work or their productivity while working remotely. Instead, this should be a, a question addressed to the organization saying that, what is it that you are doing given the context of your own industry, given the context of your own business and your business model? What is it that you are doing as an organization in terms of your norms, your culture, your technology, in terms of you know, training to both employees and to their managers? What are you doing? Are you thinking holistically about this to ensure that remote work can be effective, right? And so what is, so part of it involves provide, making sure that employees do benefit from the autonomy that remote work provides, right? So one of the temptations is to say, okay, I can't see my employees, so I'm going to monitor them more. So I'm going to use technology to monitor them more. I'm going to use AI to, you know, assess their productivity, track their eyes, how, how long they're staring at the computer. So there's a danger to saying that, okay, I can't see my employees, so I'm going to exert more control. Right, and that's the wrong way to go about. It. You have to provide employees the autonomy and create systems where 
trust is the basis for dealing with employees. You trust employees are, going, are there to do a good job. You create systems to verify that they are indeed doing a good job, but then let them figure out how to do it, right? So, so that's one sort of insight around, you know, how to deploy remote work effectively, which is, you know, creating the right infrastructure, you know, social, uh, technological, as well as sort of trust-based infrastructure so that employees can do their jobs better and providing them training and the scaffolding needed so that they can be effective, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so it really, the onus is on managers and leaders to, to create that infrastructure that allows uh, remote workers to be more effective. For remote work to be effectively implemented, is there any technology or innovation or policy that needs to be put in place to make this a more effective solution? You have a variety of technologies. And, you know, so technology adoption typically happens at the organizational level. So, you know, things like Zoom, Slack, et cetera, or Teams, you know, the, it's, it's some, somebody up there who decides that's the technology that you're going to use, right? You know, in my own uh, university, you know, the learning management system that we professors use Nobody asks us, you know, whether we would like one system versus the other, whether we, we find one system better versus the other. And so, you know, these choices are often made at a, at a much higher level, at a very centralized level, without keeping the end user in mind. And so, really, it's important to understand the, uh, you know, in terms of making sure things, you know, work well, that the employee or the end user of whatever system or infrastructure you're creating is actually able to be effective in that context. What are the best resources to learn more about remote work and maybe possibly in relation to climate change? The starting point, I would suggest, so if you're looking from a scholarly perspective, you know, Google Scholar, you know, you can start with some of the papers that publish and look at the list of references there as a starting point to branch out into the literature. There are some reviews on the topic. So, you know, I would suggest one by... Sumita Raghuram in the Academy of Management Annals. It's behind a paywall, so you may not, so your average reader or listener may not have access to it. So there are those are scholarly starting points. There's a good article by there's a, there's a great article by you know uh, Professor Prithviraj Chaudhary from Harvard Business School in Harvard Business Review about work from anywhere. So that could be a good starting point as well to to understand the basics of remote work and what 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 people are talking about you know in this domain right now you're speaking to passionate students who want to actually solve problems like these what top three skills should they study so that they actually have the ability to do so i think the top skill is the ability to keep learning constantly right so to to developing meta learning skills how to learn more effectively because i think i think with especially with the advent of artificial intelligence Knowledge by itself is not a, a very valuable commodity. It's the ability to access that, to, to be able to search for the knowledge in the right way, get to the right knowledge and quickly be able to gain, you know, at least some level of expertise, you know, and that's where meta learning comes in, the ability to constantly be willing to learn and learn more effectively and efficiently. So that's a skill that's going to be very, very important. The second is to have some home discipline, right? So if you're trying to solve climate change, uh, you need to know a lot about other disciplines, but you need to have a depth in a certain discipline that's yours, right? Uh, This could be art, it could be music, it could be engineering, it could be science, chemistry, what have you. But you need to have depth in that particular area, but also the willingness to learn across different areas so you can see connections across these different fields. So that, those, I think, are going to be skills that are relevant for any student going forward, actually for any uh, human being going forward, because whatever we learn in our bachelor's, our master's, or PhD is going to become irrelevant, outdated very soon. And so having those critical thinking skills that allow us to keep uh, updating and solving for problems as they arise through you know, learning how to you know, synthesize complex knowledge so that it applies to that specific problem. I think that's the that's the key skill that people are going to need. So be open to constant learning, be open to learning throughout your lifetime rather than just, you know, be done with your undergraduate and say, you know, that's it. Right? So that's not going to be sufficient anymore. Any final recommendations for the audience? 
So even though I've been studying remote work, I have not really thought about remote work and climate change, although I very much would, I'm an advocate for, I see this as a huge problem for humanity, and I'm an advocate for solutions around climate change, but I haven't done much myself. So in that sense, you know, people listening to your podcast, people taking this course are already, you know, 10 miles ahead of me. And I would, you know, encourage you to keep, you know, keep at it because this is a soft problem that, you know, every human being has to work together, you know, as not just in a society, but in a civilization to solve, right? It's, and so, you know, more power to everyone who's, you know, listening and taking this course and, you know, thank you for stimulating my interest in this uh, direction. So I'm going to start thinking about this a little more seriously uh, to see how remote work uh, can can be part of the climate change solution. To see the impact remote work could provide, calculate the carbon emissions saved by telecommuting instead of commuting to work or school. Use online carbon calculators and reflect on potential reductions. Thank you for taking the How to Solve Climate Change course. If you want to learn the skills to solve this global challenge, join us for free at Plato.University for exclusive content, extra resources, and actionable exercises with every lesson. This course was produced by Plato University, where students turn passions into purpose and learn skills to change the world. Learn more at Plato.University.